nice type of a legend. Please ovate <laughs> as I introduce the very acceptable Tony Carter! I'm so happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Come on in. The bed, man. The bed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sit down, my dear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Oh, listen to that. <laughs> Thank you oh, all very beautiful. much. I brought you a few gifts. I brought you this, which you dropped upstairs. Oh, lovely. Yes. Here's some candy for you. Gorgeous. Here's some flowers. How lovely. And here's something for you from me to you. You adorable oh, person. Oh, you're such Tony. a wonderful woman. I wanted to bring Not you something. Not many of my guests are as generous Don't they bring as you that. Gifts? What are well, they? Well, you deserve them. <laughs> oh, I think these are little under things, aren't are they? Are they? <laughs> I didn't know. They are, Tony. Look, Janet Ragers, you adorable <laughs> man. Look at them. <laughs> It's the least I could have done for you. It is the least you could have done. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing your homework because what? I don't buy myself beautiful underthings. Why not? I don't know. I'm a little bit monastic in my taste. I, I see. Like I don't wear hair knickers or anything like that. <laughs> but I don't splash out on my underwear, Tony. No. I don't. <laughs> Boy, and yes. not only that, but you've painted me a beautiful portrait yes, I of did. myself. I did? Yes. A portrait of you? On the wall. Where? That's not a portrait of you, that's a portrait of Harrods. Oh, well, I was in there at the time, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was almost wearing Harrods, oh, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I, paint, like I painted that for Mohammed El Fayed, who owns Harrods, who asked me to do a. Uh, he commissioned me to do a painting, <laughs> and he's, uh, he's uh, sponsoring an incredible new uh, scientific machine that's good for, instead of taking x-rays, it takes magnetic photographs of children that are ill. Oh, yeah. And it's at a hospital here in London. I think it must be the Great Ormond Street That's hospital the hospital, the Great children. Ormond for children, yes. How beautiful. It's an unusual picture. Yes. What's all that water doing there, darling? <laughs> well, uh, I decided to paint Harrods in Waikiki, where I live in Hawaii, so that's the combination. I thought it was showing the greenhouse effect on Knightsbridge. <laughs> Thank you. You signed it, Tony Curtis, but you could have signed it, Bernie Schwartz. Yes, I could have. <laughs> because I happen to know that yes. that was your name many That's when I started ago. out in life. Oh, in New York City, Bernard Schwartz. And you changed it. To yes, Tony as Curtis soon as I got old enough one. to change it, I did. I wanted to be my own man. I didn't want to be a, a part of any kind of an environment other than the person that I created. But Hollywood, did you dream of Hollywood in those Always. days? Always. And when you went there, did those dreams come true, Tony? Every Curtis? one of them. They did. I wanted to be a movie actor, and that's what I ended up. An I'm exciting. really a very privileged and lucky man. You were. Uh, didn't find it easy at first in Hollywood. No, it was difficult at first. You, you know? had to do some strange little jobs, I believe. Yes, I did. You know, uh, what I used to do was pick up tourists at the Hotel Knickerbocker, where I was staying, and I had a Buick uh, limousine that was used for funerals. And I would take these tourists and give them a tour at Universal at $5 a person. I would go to the, uh, to the uh, publicity department and get photographs of... Uh, Jimmy Stewart and Blythe and sign their names and pass them out with the five dollars. Oh, I was making, boy. you know, I was making about, I would say, the equivalent of twenty pounds a week at that time. So I needed to augment my salary somehow, and that was a good way to do and it. It must have been fun too. I loved it. It's forgivable, and I forgive oh, thank you. You, thank you. You know, Madge <laughs> is always showing Japanese tourists up here. Yeah. She does. You know. and they just all came in carrying a little flag, you know, a whole crocodile of them. I froze. I pretended to be a waxwork. <laughs> I mean, your accent 
which is a New York accent, yes. is, well, it's not very strong, but I can hear it because I have very, very a good A little hearing. bit of the New York. It gives a little colour and yes. interest and, if, may I say, raunchiness to you, David. Really? Thank you. Um, did you ever have elocution lessons? Uh, no, uh, but I used to uh, scream a lot as a boy. You know, we all used to yell at each other, Hey, Charlie! Until we tore our throats apart. Oh, and that kind of made us all speak in a low, deep, interesting voice. It does. It succeeded, that little technique. Um, <laughs> I am an Australian. Yes? And uh, I had a very strong Australian accent when I first came to London. I've completely lost it now, but I was thinking... <laughs> I was thinking of having elocution lessons to get my ex in back, Tony. I <laughs> do that as it may. When you were in Hollywood, you must have had heroes in the acting I profession. Did. Who yes. would have been your principal hero? Well, I think uh, Cary Grant and Errol Flynn were two men that I really admired a lot. Did you? Did you copy them in any other respect at all? I mean, did oh, I you? certainly did. I became Cary Grant for a long time. <laughs> you yeah. you oh. just. Just close your eyes and listen to this for a moment. Hello. Let me hear a little bit more. Judy, Judy. <laughs> There's a pin in my left boot. Dame Edna, you're a charming looking woman and I do love you. <laughs> Isn't that spooky? Oh, spooky. Oh, dear. Very good. Oh. Thank you. You know, that brings back memories of a very, very, well, a classic movie. Some like it hot because I've suddenly remembered that you did a Cary Grant impersonation. In yes, that I song. did. You know, I normally don't like the kind of performance that you did, but I adored you. In that. <laughs> you know, isn't it spooky? There's something I don't know what was it I, is. In was me. I believable as a woman? Very, but oh. the men, men in frocks, are yucky to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can see. I can see why a sensitive woman like you would be upset by something. Like that. Isn't there? I think so. Who did you base that character on? On my mother, on my first wife, and Grace Kelly. Oh, what Not an necessarily in that order. <laughs> an interesting little combination. Yes, really. How did you research it? Oh well, there were a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> we first, Jack Lemon and I, were dressed as women for a long time through the film, and in order to convince people. Marilyn one day asked me if I'd go to the bathroom with her. Marilyn? And, uh, Monroe. Oh, yeah. And I said, certainly. <laughs> so uh, we went into the ladies' room together. You uh, went into a ladies' washroom with yes, Marilyn Monroe. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I stood in front of the door <laughs> putting my lipstick on, and uh, she stood on the side laughing at all the responses because there wasn't any. There's another femme fatale I'm thinking of, Mae West. Yes. Now, you worked with her. I worked with Mae West. I Towards did a movie called Sextet. Sextet? Sextet. She was then 92 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And she was... 90, how much? 92. 92. She was deaf, or almost deaf, and couldn't see very well. So, <laughs> literally, literally, the, the darling woman had to be uh, propelled, trolleyed all over the place. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. May I tell you a story about uh, dear Mae West? You certainly lovely woman. may. Everything I tell you is with affection for the woman. And just between ourselves. Yes, just between Please, us. Please, no further. Yeah. When, uh, <laughs> when we did the film, she couldn't hear too well, so they uh, attached a hearing aid to her, and which the director stood in a, in a little box that looked like a telephone room, and he would speak her lines to her, and she would repeat them. But he would do it over the other actor's lines, so that when... I finished speaking, she would be ready to speak. And he was smoked, and that little room got all fogged in. <laughs> and he couldn't see anything. All he could do was talk to her. But it was a low-frequency telephone, low-frequency radio. And so, she started picking up the local police station. <laughs> and right in one of the lines, she said, there's a 608 on Madison Avenue. <laughs> worked in a film with crustaceans. I you're did? In a, yes, you did. You may not remember it, but you're in a spooky film with seafood. 
The lobster man from Mars. The lobster man yeah. from Mars. Yeah. It's a collector's item, Jamie. Yes, it certainly is. Your daughter, Jamie Lee Curtis, yes. also has recently been in a seafood movie. She was? Called A Fish Called Wanda. Oh, she yes. <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of things in common, don't we? <laughs> An interest in fishy things. And of course, Madge is a bit fishy, too. She's a, she's a bearded old mollusk, that woman. She's a bit more like a hermit crab, as a matter of fact. 